Welcome to Factorio. My name is Nilaus, and this is a guide and showcase on how I built this self-expanding base you're seeing here in front of you. I released a time-lapse video not so long ago, and uh, that was just basically showing you how this was all done, and I encourage you to check that out first. So this video is more in, in terms of how I did it and not so much what it actually does. So um, if you are interested in the more technical things, if you are just looking at how was it actually done, then this is definitely the video for you. The idea for the self-expanding base was kind of an ultimate design challenge and automation challenge. After the 7,500 hours of Factorio, I thought, you know what, the game can play itself. Uh, I don't need to be part of it anymore, hence uh, this challenge here. And I also think that I'm in a, uh, uniquely, a unique position to complete this challenge because of uh, the mileage I've been putting into this game uh, already. So for example, all of my blueprints are modular, all my train systems are scalable. I, I want to say infinitely scalable, but I know you, anyone would comment on it, but they're pretty damn scalable. Uh, city blocks are just a natural building blocks for this. And then sort of on the personal side, I have a background in operations research, so I'm very much accustomed to designing things and uh, building them uh, build, uh, taking complex uh, real-world situations and making them into uh, to mathematical models. Uh, also, I have 15 years of experience on designing and building software from the ground up, so I'm very good at managing scope and uh, figuring out what is easy and hard to do. And then maybe most importantly, I have a community that's filled of developers and engineers to help me on the journey because this is not a one-person project. It is me sort of uh, sitting at the helm of it, project management, product managing it, but a lot of uh, individual contributors adding in and coming up with ideas for this build. This video will go through all the components of the base and explain how they work and how the challenges face for each functionality. You can use the tab just to navigate and I also have a special surprise that I'm thinking anyone with a development experience will very much appreciate. As usual, if you are enjoying this kind of content, then uh, be sure to hit the like button, uh, subscribe to the channel, and if you want to get access to the save games and blueprints, uh, or just want to support the channel even more, then consider pledging on Patreon. I wanted to keep this challenge as close to vanilla as possible, but it's not possible to deploy blueprints outside of doing it uh, manually. So that means I need a mod that can deploy blueprints. And that's called uh, that's called Recursive Blueprint. It is an amazing mod and it's super cool. I wish it was kind of integrated, but then again, I understand why it's a, a mod because it gets really complicated. Uh, what it can do is uh, it basically has a chest. And if you put a blueprint in this chest, it'll deploy the blueprint. That's pretty simple, but it also can need, it can take some commands. So we're going to be setting up like a simple case uh, like this here. Now I'm going to take a random blueprint here and just try to place it in here and see what happens. Nothing happens because it doesn't set any uh, any uh, values. It doesn't know what to actually deploy. So what we need to do is we need to set up a some conditions here and some parameters that we can then feed into this location. There are three parameters we want to uh, to get. It says the construction. This is the blueprint number. Then it is an X coordinate and a Y coordinate. You can do a lot of other stuff as well, but those are the ones that I'm using. Those are the ones that are relevant to this one. And that means if, uh, if we do this, then it should deploy blueprint number one at a starting position 10 to the, uh, compared to where we are, where this, this container is, it should have the start position of the blueprint shifted 10 in the X direction and 10 in the Y direction. There we go. And it has now deployed a blueprint here. And obviously it's uh, not really working. Uh, there's also a, uh, an extra mod added here that just tells us what it's actually doing. And you can see here the blueprint is now deployed. So that means this is how we determine. So we need somewhere to tell what blueprint to deploy because our blueprint here has a lot of different blueprints and we need to be able to tell it where to deploy it. And then the last one is we need to be able to tell when to deploy it. So those are the parameters we need to solve with this uh, deployer. Now this is a little bit of a uh, of a mess. Uh, it actually looks a little bit like a mess, but it actually uh, there's a method to the madness of all of this. So it has a, a number of conditions. We see the central point here is the deployer. What's really important is that when you put into the deployer, you have to move it out immediately, because otherwise it keeps stamping down the blueprint on the same location. That's not necessarily a problem, but that's certainly not what you want. We want it to stamp down the blueprint on one tick and then move on in the next tick and then get it out. So that's why this. Uh, this one is doesn't have any conditions. It simply just moves it out of, uh, of the box. So we now need to look at what are the options for uh, moving through this cycle here, because this has to be a, a, a complete cycle. 
I'm making a belt here because I actually wanted to take a little bit of time. I don't want it to go uh, sort of insert into a box, insert into a box, insert into a box, because then it can just operate too fast. What are the conditions we actually want to to govern this by? Well, I'm I want to make sure that when we deploy a blueprint, the robots get busy because that means they start working on actually deploying it. Then after they are busy, I want them to be idle again. And when they're idle, that means we can uh, deploy the next blueprint. And that's basically the cycle. First, we have to sort of measure, are they busy? And then afterwards, are they idle? So if we look at this condition, this one says the Z is less than T. And if we look at here, that means the available robots is less than the total robots. That means this one is blocked right now because the amount of robots in here, construction robots, is 30, 300 out of 300. So that means 300 robots are there, 300 are idle. That means this one is blocked. Only when they, so after it deploys the blueprint, it then has to wait here until the robots actually fly out. Super, super important because when they fly out, uh, if, if I don't have this gate here, it'll just go through and then deploy the next one immediately. We don't want that. So fly out, good. And then it comes over here and this one has a condition that says now they are idle. That's also important. So this one checks that it is actually idle and at that point it moves it into this location. Here, this one is uh, not moving uh, anything. That means it stays here. It stays here until it gets a command that uh, it has. it's actually going to deploy something. So that means it's going to be stuck up here until another part of the system, which we'll get to in a bit, is telling us, please deploy blueprint number 17. And then at that point, when we get that command, we will enable it to go into the deployer and then go out again. Cool. Let's uh, see that in action here. So that uh, is getting up to this location. And then we have to wait until the next part. So we're now looking at a new cycle and getting ready for the next one. We can see that there are robots are finishing up the last bits. When it hits 300, then this will enable and put it over here. That will enable the new uh, loop to start, and then it will start identifying what is the next build. And it'll go quickly. There we go. So now it is waiting for a robot signal, a, a construction bot signal that came in here. Once it had identified what to build, it'll build the next one, and then it goes over here. So this is going to be the idle location most of the time when the robots are busy. And as soon as they're not busy, it starts a new loop again, and then it'll wait at this point. So the next case is, what are we actually deploying? Well, we are deploying this blueprint book. This blueprint book, uh, it is uh, numbered. So all of these, I, I told you that it sends a construction bot signal inbound. And that con uh, that number is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and so on and so forth. So I can actually s determine exactly which one is going to be deployed. If we look at these blueprints, you can see that they are all beautiful city blocks. They work really well. They all attach exactly to each other. If we go out here and look at some of these, they, they work in a way that normally, normally I would have my sacred path. Now I have my sacred train line out here. I have made small train here and some of them, for example, for this iron part, we will have two iron, uh, two stations here, two unloading stations that combine in here. And they are, oh yeah, by the way, you're going to notice uh, this about the trains. These trains, we'll come back to why we are building these trains once we get to the train system. Uh, but I, I'm... I acknowledge it looks a bit odd, but that's kind of half the point. Right, so these train stations are, can take two in here, two in there. They are just merged so that they come in from this side and then they go out here. Each city block has a, uh, a, a fuel station because I need to make sure that all the fuel, all the train stations are, or all the outbound trains, they belong to the city block here and they will now need to be fed with fuel before they can actually leave. And therefore, each of these city blocks are completely independent of each other. There's no uh, no interaction. There's no uh, block that a certain thing cannot be next to another thing because the whole thing is demand driven. That's extremely important and something I, I, I take for granted, but something that I think it's really important to, uh, to mention. And I'll mention it uh, time and time again. So each of these just takes the inbound materials and then provides the outbound material. Uh, and that's how each of those city blocks work. Uh, we have our power city block as well. Also just providing some city, some blocks here. And those are the only ones that are, that's, that's there. Let's have a look again at the blueprint book. So I have uh, just made all the different, this only, this is really all you need to make an entire base. This, this many blueprints. So it's actually, it was something that surprised me a lot, like how little is actually needed for, for building an entire, uh, an entire 
entire factory. So now we looked at the rhythm of how to deploy it and also what is being deployed, but then we don't know which one's going to be deployed at any given time. So this comes up here. This is what I call the brain. And um, for anyone else who, has, or if you've seen anyone else make a self-expanding base, they have a monstrous amount of circuits. I don't for two different reasons. Um, maybe even one reason, debugging. This is something I, I know very well from my, <laughs> my real world experience is that you have to make things that are supportable, maintainable and debuggable. And uh, a monstrous array of circuits is insanely difficult to debug because there is no, like, you have to invent breakpoints yourself and this. So what I have uh, decided to implement at the advice of, uh, of people in chat, and then we sort of expanded it from there, is that the whole logic is working with a belt. So what we're going to do is we are going to restart the, uh, the rhythm here because I removed the blueprint, so I'm going to go in here. And uh, what we need to do is I want, I'm going to sit here, I've used the blue belts because... Uh, uh, so I can see the difference here. There are two loops. One loop is for my Nilos coin, which is, uh, by the way, if you have downloaded the save, the Nilos coin is now on the blueprint, uh, the mod portal, so you can actually use the blueprints now. So um, there is a loop here, outer loop, that goes all the way around. Technically goes to by bypass, but it won't, will never bypass, but then it goes through here. So on the red belt, this is for um, for the Nilos coin. This is the basically the the pointer of where we are in the code at any given point. And the other one, the blue one, is the marker of what we are actually building so that each of uh, the city blocks that we can build in our blueprint book, it corresponds to, you can see here, each of these correspond to an icon here uh, that corresponds to that icon and uh, some things like uh, the satellite is for the rocket, si rocket science, for example. And uh, that means that we can now track what we're actually building. And then this is just a repeatable pattern of, uh, of basically the same same conditions. Basically, we're going to have certain conditions. Let's look at, zoom in on one of these. Mm, steel. Steel is fine. That's just sort of in the middle. Let's, this block here uh, is starting from, uh, let's see if we can do something. This is a block. It's three wide, only three wide. It's very important that it's as small as possible because then, well, is as small as possible. So first of all, what is the rule for picking up from this belt? This is the Nilos coin is going around and wherever it gets picked up, it'll be picked up at the first one that is available here for pickup. That means this functions as a priority list. So the highest priority is solar. That's a very special one because uh, that can always be done. Then um, in the next one is resources, then it's fuel, and then it goes iron, copper, steel, stone breaks and so on and so forth so forth and then all the way at the end we build we expand to more more science production so the first one that has two lights on is the first one that actually gets picked up and this has two lights on two blue lights means that it'll be picking up so if it picks up the um, the blue uh, what does it take for this to be enabled well there are two conditions as you can see two lights that has to be on one there is a demand in the network for more steel and secondly, we haven't just recently built steel. We'll come back to that, but I don't want to build the same thing again and again. Um, and therefore I, I block things that are um, that I've just recently built. So there has to be a demand, obviously, and it can't just have been built. So those are the two conditions. In, in these cases here, we can see that this means that there is no demand. This means there is a demand, but there, it is in taboo because it's it's just been uh, been built. And then over here, there's no demand um, and so on and so forth. But let's take a look at this. So what happens is it comes in here. It triggers the message from uh, here. It triggers this one to take the steel indicator and output it. Once it takes the steel indicator and outputs it, it sends a signal on the red wire back. And that's the one that triggers the new build. That's the one that identifies. If you can see in here, it says blueprint number nine. If you look here, it's a uh, number three in the second line. So that is blueprint number nine is steel smelting and so on and so forth. All of these have a number. So this is blueprint number 20. This is blueprint number 21 and blueprint number 32. So that's basically all it does here. It's identifying which one gets built and then it sends the signal back to the deployer. Deploy blueprint number nine in this case. Let's see if it works. <laughs> that's always fun. So what we need to do is we need to take our 
I can't put it in here. That is just there to go a beep. Okay, it's going to build solar first. Solar is a special condition. The reason why it's solar is a special condition is because even though I have built uh, solar, I can, I'm allowed to build it again and again. What happens uh, then while we're waiting for this to build? And then I can talk about the little bit of the blocking part. So once we built a, uh, a, a module, that's going to be the steel module. Let's actually wait until the steel module gets built. That gets a lot easier to explain then. Now the blueprint is almost done with, and we can see here the robots are coming back. This is the number of robots that are idle. And when this hits 300, then it starts a new cycle. And then the new cycle will go from here. You can see that this is gated. It's, uh, it's gated by, this one says that it must be, robots must be busy. This one says robot must be idle. There we go, it started up. And then we can see the little coin. It's taking care of all the logic and it gets in and builds us a steel smelting. So the real, biggest advantage of uh, of this of using the coin here is that we get so many things for free like there is no way that you accidentally have two things working at once because you can't have the uh, this thing at once here but if you made it a circuit network it's really difficult to sort of not accidentally trigger things. Another thing that when working with circuits, every calculation takes one tick and you might have several different calculations going in different directions, such as like power, uh, resource availability, and sort of the flow of logic. And you have to make sure that they, they when you compare those numbers to determine, you have to make sure that they are uh, at the same tick they are available, the data is available at the same time. Sometimes things are only available at one tick of the calculation and that's not, uh, not great, not great. So this uh, gets uh, gets us a lot of things. Plus, it's very easy to see where in the program we are at any given moment because the program is right here. It's simply standing here. It's like, oh, okay, well, and now I know it's an idle situation. It's waiting for being released until the next cycle. It will be released once uh, this reaches 300 and all the robots are busy or are idle. Once they're idle, which would be happening in a second, then we will see it will be released for a new loop. And then we can go down uh, this loop and figure out which one will be the next one. And we can just scale, come on, 99, you can do it. Uh, then we can scale down here and figure out which one will be the next one to be built. There we go, it got released. And what happens now is that it flows all the way down here. It just checks, is this one available? Or is this one needed? Is this one needed? Is this one needed? So on and so forth, all the way down here. Uh, you can also see that there is an extra third condition here, uh, down here at the end. And that means is because I, I don't want, I built the science in exactly the same quantity as we need uh, as we need science labs. So the science lab can consume six science per second and each of these will produce six science per second. So I don't want to, even though if, if it says it demands more uh, green science or blue science, then I won't milk, make more until I've actually made an extra one of the uh, uh, of the science labs back here. So that's kind of a, a way to, to sort of diff demand drive, driving it. And we can also see that uh, it's, it's now started up some low density structures, which will probably trigger some more things. Let's look a little bit of this one. This is called a taboo list. The taboo list is, uh, comes from operations research. And uh, the first thing uh, is that it is spelled T-A-B-U. It's not a misspelling. That's how it's written in the literature. And that's how it is spelled. And that way, you know, it's uh, a reference to operations research. It is an algorithm that I used in my master's thesis. And then I found it really funny that I don't know, 20 years later, I'm implementing the same algorithm in uh, in a game. So whenever someone asks me, do you use your master's, uh, do you use your uh, education for uh, for your current job? And go like, yes, I do. I actually implemented my master's thesis uh, uh, into my latest factorial base. Like, how cool is that? So what does it actually do? Well, the thing is, if you build a new city block, let's take the one that was ju that's just being built. Now, if there was a demand for for low density structures, then it builds a new block. But as you can see here, just the fact that we build it doesn't mean that there's additional supply of uh, low density because it takes a while for the trains to come in, for the processing to start, for the trains to fill up, for the train to reach the new destination. So I, I don't want to be in a situation where if I'm requesting low density structure, it makes a low density. And then by the time it's done, it's of course still requiring more low density structures. And then I'll build another one, another one, another one until I have 17 of those next to each other well, maybe five of those next to each other, uh, before it realizes that, oh, we have way overbuilt it. So what I do is I make it a taboo so that the algorithm is not allowed to take it. That's why, that means that it's stuck here. 
And what happens is that it, it then takes some number of iterations. You can see the Nilos coin, when it flows around, it goes through all of these, and all of these trigger the taboo list to, to go up one tile. This means that right now we have sulfur, uh, red, copper, steel, and low density in taboo. And then you will see very soon, we should see, okay, this was a, a power line, so that doesn't trigger that sort of closed loop here. But any new will sort of increment it down here. And then when that uh, goes through, then it'll release the sulfur because now it's been five now five iterations since we built the last sulfur. And that means it, the, the sulfur build we have done will have sort of caught up and supplied the materials. And it makes sure that we don't sort of uh, spam build anything. It also makes sure that there's going to be like a, a certain maximum cadence, stuff like steel, as soon as you make purple science there's going to be an absolutely ridiculous amount of steel de demand but i don't want it to sort of build a lot of steel after uh, right after each other it i wanted to make a steel and then put it in a t the table list and then it um it has to wait like five other iterations where it makes something like stone bricks or red circuits and something like that and, and then it comes back and then it can make steel again uh, stuff like green circuits and steel are in high demand so they are uh, they're going to be built more more of those that means that they will just barely jump out of the table list before they'll be sort of selected and built again and we now see hopefully there we go that was rocket fuel that got built gets built and that goes now into taboo rocket fuel is now in taboo and as it goes out here now sulfur goes back out of the taboo list and goes back into being available and when it's available it can also start uh, working, but I can't take anything that's avail that's not available. That's why I have two lights. One is demand and one is, is it even allowed to be built? So that's how the table list ensures that we have something. It's a super, in super simple algorithm that serves a really strong purpose. Here we have the demand overview where we can really uh, visualize uh, how, the, how this is actually set up. This is uh, the red ones are the ones that are currently in taboo and the uh, blue ones or the teal ones here are the ones that are demanded. So what we can see is that the stuff that's demanded and the stuff that is in taboo are a very big overlap because of course we demanded more steel and then we put it in taboo and that means it will flow through here, right? What's going to happen at this point is that it'll flow all the way through here. It'll probably want to make this, but I don't allow this, I think, because I uh, already have enough of these. Uh, it, it just doesn't, hasn't caught up. And that means it'll actually get into the unique position where it'll start making another science lab. And therefore the base will now start scaling up and that will trigger a whole lot of uh, new demand for the base. If we look at our production here and look at the science there, uh, this has now gone up to here, 600. It should be, what is that? Well, it went up here. It, it, if we look at on more time, it has been very stable. And then it should be 360. That's the theoretical maximum it should be providing. And then it jumps up and then it's jumping up. And now it's actually start working on the next iteration. Then what we see here is that because it's demand driven, we can go out and look at the demand here. This here, the way it generates demand is that it says it looks at the boxes in a station and the boxes in the station, if they are empty, then it says there's no purple science because it's empty. So then it starts demanding purple science coming in here and demanding another block. It'll first demand a train. And if it's completely empty, then it will also demand back into the network. So now we can see the stuff that's on the green wire here. Those are the ones that are de being demanded in the network. Let's have a look. And that corresponds to the teal ones. And that means now it starts over up here in the loop it starts over and then it takes the first one that is available and that's the one that gets started that means now red circuits are going to be uh, built more of those so we looked at now how it gets deployed uh, what it chooses to deploy what gets deployed with the blueprint but also now we need to look at where because I need to make sure that it doesn't stamp the blueprint on top of each other and uh, that means I need an algorithm for placing the next one and the algorithm that seems more obvious is a spiral algorithm which means that it goes up and then around and then goes around and around and around and around and uh, that is a, a a pain to do so um that's what this thing does 
And I didn't build it. I just blatantly copy pasted it from a community member who was uh, cl more clever than me to figure out a way to identify it. So what it basically outputs is the coordinates X and Y measured in city blocks. And every time you sort of send a signal in, it just returns where the next uh, X, Y coordinates. You can see here, it just incremented from three to four uh, X. And that means that it realized that the next one was x equal 3 and y equal 8 that was here well minus and then it just increments at one and then it increments all the way over here and then it starts going up and it works flawlessly and i have no idea how it works but that's the beauty of, beauty of having uh, uh, having awesome community members that can then make stuff and then all i do is i send a signal in and i uh, interpret the signal out i take the signal out and multiply it by 100 by 100 because that's the city block size, and then I feed it into the next coordinates to feed into the deployer for the next uh, next iteration. Super, uh, super neat that we can then take sort of a call a little function that basically says, where's the next one going to be located? It calculates it, it returns the X, Y coordinates, and then we have that stored for the next loop and so on. And then we sort of increment it by one. That's uh, that's really nice. We basically call this function and then it returns returns the output. Power management. Let's take a look at that because that's an important part. And uh, as you could see up in the demand here, you have we have 129 solar power blocks. So we are completely solar powered. That the reason why I chose solar power is because it doesn't need any water, and water would be absolutely painful to to manage. So this is the power management part. It works uh, in the following way. It is this graph here is showing the percentage of accumulated charge. You can see it dropped down to 99. That means the last light turns off. Each of these represent a, a 10 minute interval, uh, sort of looking in the past, so we can sort of see a, uh, a a graph of the progression of how this is actually dropping now because we are getting into nighttime. And if we look out here, we can see the graph and we can see that the solar panels lose charge or at night, obviously, and then the accumulators start working. And as the accumulated charge here drops less and less, it'll now go to 87, you can see here. And this one is sort of for each 10 10 second slice of uh, of time, we can see that it now is sort of trending downwards. We can see this is a current and it's now trending downwards because it's nighttime. The way that it works is that if it ever drops below 50%, which it is about to, then I will tr uh, raise this flag. This is the SR latch that says, make another solar power. That's the most important thing, make another solar power block and um, and and keep making solar power blocks until you are above 50% again. So that's why it's an SR latch that it just says, keep doing it. Even if it goes up, then you still have to build another one. See now it triggered. And that means up here in our graph, that one has turned on. And that means the next loop, the uh, next city block will be the priority for the solar block that comes in first. Uh, so that's really important. What's also here is that I don't want it to completely crash. You can see that it's going down quickly. If we look at this here, it's going down and even it might actually crash before nighttime. So what am I going to do? Well, I am actually just switching off power, uh, different smelting blocks. So the smelting blocks have a power switch here and they switch off at uh, at various intervals. So that first I switch off the oil refining, use a lot of power. Then I switch off stuff like uh, steel. Then I switch off copper and okay, somewhere I also switch off stone bricks, but there's only one of those. And then I switch off lastly, uh, the iron. So, and then you can see here, we now start the next loop with building more solar power. But what is really saving is not sort of the city block that we're building. It's the fact that now it's also getting into daytime, but as we build more blocks, we'll use more power. And that means we need to continually build more solar uh, solar power. You can set it at a different interval, but I find this to be working really well. It dropped now uh, down to 30 and then it starts picking up again. We can now see that it should be trending upwards soon. Let's see here. Uh, solar power is increasing. It has uh, is now increasing and you can see that the accumulated charge is starting to go up again and we can see 34. So right now, even though it goes above 50%, this one will not turn off. It'll only turn off when another block is built because I don't want it. I want it to every time it drops below 50%, I must build at least one city block of, uh, of solar power. So uh, we'll just wait for this one to go up. And then we can see also that if we look here, uh, we should be able to see that iron is now started up again, copper starting up again. Uh, this is also starting up again. Okay, so our accumulated charge is, is getting up there. Great. 
yes, everything is uh, is working again, up to 52%, but this one is still on, and we're now recovering because it's getting into daytime. Let's see here, and it's up to daytime, it's filling up the accumulator chart, and it should be taking about half the day to fill up the entire chart. And we can see now we built another solar block, and now we turned off this light because it's we just built one, and um, this one has turned off. So now we're up in the green, and we have now recovered power dur during the night uh, by making two more si solar power blocks before going back into the normal cycle of the factory expansion. So we've been having a look at the actual base and uh, what we we know how this is built and where it's built and why and what priority, but we don't actually know how it works in terms of logistics. So let's just zoom in to a uh, random block here. This is a busy block. This is a copper built block and uh, this has an input and an output. So what uh, we're looking at the trains, everything is supplied by trains. So that's the only way things get in and out. Uh, the train stations are working in the way that they, this is my standard build for train stations. They are very simple, the trains. They go from, the all stations names are either a provider or requester. And um, they just go for full and then go to empty. Super simple. All the logic is not even in uh, uh, in this, uh, in the provider, the provider just says how many trains are allowed to park here, and that's basically how much space we have. In this case, I want two trains to park here, and and in most other cases, I only want a single, a single train uh, parked in the output location. Which one is the actual output? This is the output location as well. So that's just hard coded as one because if another train came in, it would sort of get stuck out here and block the transport on the network. Another thing that about the train network generally, what you can see here is there are no left-hand turns. Of course, it's right-hand drive because it's the only thing that makes sense, uh, but there are no left-hand turns because left-hand turns, first of all, would take up a lot of space and it would be a complete mess in here. Uh, so if they need to do left-hand turns, they have to sort of go around in, uh, in, in the weirdest of ways. Let's see if we can just follow this one and then see if that goes somewhere weird. Um, hopefully. Okay, so let's see where it goes. Yes, this is exactly it. There you go. That was pretty, uh, if it, pretty good example. It came from here and it wanted to go in there, like really short distance. But I had to go up, turn right, 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 and then in order to get in here, I don't care. It's not a problem. These are small trains. I don't want them to sort of be stuck in here uh, with right-hand turns or don't even mention roundabouts. Uh, this train system works absolutely brilliant. It'll force the trains to drive more but they are quick trains, they're small trains, so they block intersections very shortly, and they uh, they work really efficiently. I also have to uh, to address, like the I guess we could say, the elephant in the room in, in terms of this. Why the hell have I chosen to make the trains 111 uh, instead of having the usual locomotive up front? Well, for two reasons. Um, one is less important than the other one. The less important reason is that, look, it's it has a nice symmetry to it for some of these builds like this. There's a nice symmetry to it. That's one reason. But the real reason is because they want you to ask, why the hell did you do this? It makes it unique, it makes it different. And um, I, I like that. It's I know people get uh, triggered by it and I love that. Love that when you can trigger people with, uh, with weird factorial designs. But you know, there's no difference here. It works just fine and uh, it does have like a nice symmetry where it goes out in the middle and then it can sort of go to both sides. And there are a few exceptions to this. Uh, the worst one, the one if I really have to trigger you, then uh, I'll do it here. Look, the blue side, the blue circuit is a, a, a wagon in front of the train. I know it's insane, but um, I, I'm doing it. Right, so let's look at how it works in terms of the logic. This uh, is a probably actually a good example of how it works. So each each station, uh, each city block has whatever provider train it has is part of the blueprint. So in this case, this is a blue circuit. That means the blue circuit train is part of the blueprint. Up here, this is a steel. So the steel train is part of the, the blueprint. But down here, it's not uh, the... The requester trains are not. The reason why the requester trains are not part of the blueprint is because then I risk that if I have more requester stations than provider stations, I will would also end up with more trains and the trains would then go try to go to some, uh, some provider stations and they would get stuck. And I want the trains to be idle at the requester station or the provider station, sorry, like this. They're standing here, even if they're full, 
and then they're just waiting for a command and then go out then come back here and get filled up for the next round that's how i want it uh, want it to be uh, then we can also see that the logic here there's no logic it just says how many trains can be parked at this location uh, but the logic comes in on opening and closing the station actually not but it's by train limits opening and closing by train limits here and that's what we are uh, what we are doing here so this is a busy station because obviously green circuits into blue is a very busy one so i want to be able to request up to two trains and therefore i have this these conditions here uh, what we see here is that there are three conditions three things i'm measuring i'm measuring the content of the boxes here uh, that is really funny how it just absolutely slowed down suddenly um it measuring the content of the boxes and we can see the content of the boxes is 56,000 uh, green circuits and the 56,000 green circuits is then compared to is it less than 2,000 if it's less than 2,000 that means the trains have failed to keep up with demand and we need to make more green circuit uh, city blocks so this is what I mean when I say that it's demand driven if the if a station is completely empty build more of the of the city box providing because that means the trains by themselves are not able to keep up but uh, what I can do here is I'm saying if it's less than 50,000, request one train. If it's less than 20,000, request yet another train. That means that we are sort of, right now we're not requesting any. You can see train limit over on the right hand side, zero of zero. But once it drops below 50,000, then it will uh, it'll request one train. And if it drops below 20,000, it'll request two trains coming in here. And if it drops below 2,000, that means there's a problem, there's problem and we don't have enough green circuit in the network. Uh, and therefore we need more green circuit builds. This is a, this means that when we go back to our center, this is how demand is, uh, is, is derived. That if we look here on the green, green circuits, uh, the icons there are this, the city blocks that are requested. So we are requesting three steel, uh, two satellite production, one solar panel that will keep going and some uh, labs, which is sort of be, if nothing else, we'll always make, make labs. Then we're requesting some raw resources, some green circuits, some blue circuits, some rocket fuel, and some uh, yellow signs. So those are the ones that are currently being uh, being requested in the network, and it'll just sort of just start working on them. And since uh, solar panel is there, then solar panel is the one that we'll be doing first because that's always the highest priority. So far, what I have shown you is how it works. But anyone who has ever done anything relating to development know that things don't work, and in the beginning, I built something and then I started letting it, uh, letting it start. And then if it didn't work, I would sort of uh, deconstruct the whole thing or I would load a save and then uh, then make the fixes and then start it up again. Now that doesn't work because this base is huge and this takes six hours, I think, of uh, constant running. And if I want to, if I find a mistake now, what the hell am I gonna do in order to, to fix it? So at this point, it is incredibly important to have a good work process to handle debugging in production. This is our production environment, having managing our source code, managing our deployment and all that. So I'm going to show you uh, because there is a, a, a bug in the system and um, we're going to be I'm going to show you how I manage uh, debugging and uh, updating source code and redeploying it to production. And this is, I think, if you're a developer, I, I'm hoping that you will appreciate this. So the first thing I was looking at and I found this error and I decided not to do it. If we see here, there's two steel being demanded. That's a problem. And it's just weird why there's always steel demanded. Because when I looked at the steel location, they were actually fine. So I started looking around for uh, for where the steel was demanded. And then I found an actual error in, the, in this. And this is what always happens with these kind of things. It's the smallest of errors. Uh, first, I need to find the purple science. Uh, actually, there's a good way of finding purple science. I can go up here and then I can just go to find that train. And we can go to that one. And then, no, that one. Yeah. All right. So this is the purple science. This is where steel is requested. And this one should not be here. So what I'm actually seeing is, you can see here, these, these are not getting... Uh, if you look at bricks, it says input signal 15,000 bricks. This one has no input signal. Why does it not have any input signal? Oh, the green the green wire is not connected from the boxes into here. And because of that, it doesn't work. So the easiest thing in the world, this is what you would do in a production system. You fix the production issue. Now immediately it works. And that was one. 
let's uh, find the other one. Uh, here. Here. Was that the other one? Or was that the one? Yep, that's the other one. We have two of those. And here we go. Well, now I've fixed it in production system. This is not what developers do. This is what support does. They fix it in production system. But now what? Our blueprint is not updated. And next time a purple science block is going to be stamped down, it's also going to have problems. So what I need to do now is I need to break. Oh, it needs another round. It went just into another round. I'm going to pick it up here. So now I have paused the production system. It is not working. It's not going to make the damage any worse, but it's still up and running. You don't take Facebook down because you need to fix a code. You might stop the deployment of new features, which is what we've done. We've now stopped the deployment of new features. The loop is stopped. The base still works and we fixed it in production. So everything works now. It just doesn't it continue to expand. So what I'm going to do is now I'm going to go into the source code. Then I open up the editor expanded, uh, editor extended. Then I have another layer here, and that goes into a completely different layer of the uh, of the game, where this is corresponding to my source code. I have every single one of my blueprints stamped down here in the version that is in the blueprint blueprint book. And then we know that the problem was over on this side. I go in and fix it in the source code. It's now fixed in the source code. What I need to do then is I need to go with the purple science. I need to, this is compiling the code. So now it's compiled because now it's in the blueprint book. I will now go back into the live environment and go out of the editor mode. And as I place this one here, I have now deployed it back into production and the and it will now continue to work. There we go. It has now deployed the next one and the loop is uh, is continuing. So this is the cycle that I'm using for fixing errors. It is incredibly robust because I have this extra layer where I keep the source code intact and I can just stop, fix it in production, go into the source code, fix it, compile it, deploy it, and we're back. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, and it, it works really, really efficiently for fixing errors in production uh, without having to rebuild the whole thing. Now, there are some shortcomings of this one, this model, and uh, some things that uh, are natural extensions, and you, you can complain that they are not included in this version. Uh, this version is about the model. The Can we make the logistics work? Can we make the blueprint work? Can we make the logic work? Yes, we can. All right, so there are two things that are not included in this model. One is... I'm using infinite resources when building a new block like this. You can see uh, once it starts working, you will see that this one will just fly out here. Come on, come on little robots, where are you? Are you not busy? Yeah, they are, look at that. Blinky, 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 blinky. We have super robots, super built, but we also have normal robots. Um, and that means all of these solar panels are not built. They are just magically invented. I could, not very difficult, say that this would be the first block and then the first two blocks would probably be a hub that would sort of make sure that we had resources and then I start to make make the items needed for the uh, for the hub so that we can actually get thing get things working um, that can definitely be done um, and it would be an extension it, the problem with that is that the base would flow a lot slower obviously because it would have to sort of wait maybe 10 15 20 minutes to build up stockpiles for the next deployment and then deploy it which means that from a streaming perspective, when I'm streaming this, it would be less engaging to look at because we'd sort of, it, it would be a lot less times that things get deployed. But technically there is no problem with actually building it. It, um, I don't think so at least. Um, and, and therefore it could be done into something that's a natural extension. The other thing is uh, in terms of resources, we have, uh, we're using infinite resources and they are simply the infinite raw resource. They're simply invented in these blocks and that means trains just get here. Uh, adding uh, adding an automatic identifier for the next block uh, to get resources to identify if there are resources would be another thing that is very complicated. It can be done. Uh, it can't really be done with uh, with without uh, uh, it can't really be done without mods. There's a mod that scans a city block that it or scans an area for resources, and that would pr probably be something that I would add as a uh, as an as a first loop so basically when you start before you even start another loop you scan if the next location contains resources if it contains resources then build a resource gathering block at that point 
and then um, and then sort of skip over and then continue the build. And that's probably how that would work. It's not going to be very efficient, but it certainly could work. And um, and that would be one option. But feeding a base of this size would also require quite a lot of additional resources uh, because the base is, um, well, it is producing a, quite a bit of the, of science at the, as it is right now. Yeah, so it's, it's upwards here towards the 720. That's where it, it should peak at. Uh, but it's a little bit unstable right now, but this is understandable. Uh, so that's where the, um, that means that it, it is a lot of resources that have to come in. And it would also require some a, a, a building that is scanning an area, which is not really very standard. And therefore, it's it's an extension that definitely could be done that I just haven't bothered with because I, I, I wanted a design challenge here. And that's certainly what we've completed. Uh, the last thing is about biters. Yes, we could do something with biters as well. It would also make it immensely more complicated so that you'd sort of have to build a wall around your current city block size so that you defend it. You would have to sort of either make spider trons and have those go out or something like that. There would, there would definitely be, be, uh, be, be some challenges in terms of how to, uh, how to do that. But I'm sure that it could be done. Um, I've done some automatic expansion for biters uh, before and it, it, it can work. So, so those are definitely challenges, but it's not the core part. For me, the core part is seeing this base in operation and seeing it continue to expand. It has now reached a size of 289 city blocks right now, and it'll just keep going. And that's the beauty of it. It keeps going. And if you are a patron and have access to save games, by all means, download it, let it run couple of days just see how big it gets and see if see when it breaks because of course there'll be something that makes it break um, it'll take longer and longer to get out and build those uh, those locations uh, but um, it, it'll still work and you know what maybe maybe you can even get it to uh, to to get a mega base level if you let it run long enough don't know it'll be interesting so uh, that is basically the conclusion of, uh, of this guide. And I hope that it's inspiring you maybe to start your own project. Maybe uh, you want to download this and uh, try this, uh, try your hand on this yourself. Maybe you want to make some, some additions, some changes, uh, some things that you want to do different. Maybe you, uh, I've worked on making it with blue science levels. So it's red belts and blue assemblers and no mods, uh, no modules and no beacons, but that's just my decision on, on how to do this. So, um, Maybe you can make some changes. Hopefully it is inspiring for you and I hope you have enjoyed this video. If you have, be sure to hit the like button. It helps a lot with the visibility and uh, let me know that you are interested in this kind of more technical stuff as well. Thank you very much for watching. Until next time, take care and stay effective.